News of the Times Serial Killer Saturdays Francis Billing and Catherine Frary The Burnham Poisoners Welcome to today's episode of Serial Killer Saturdays. In this episode, it is 1835 in Burnham, Norfolk, England, and the little village is rocked with a series of mysterious deaths all within the same small vicinity and within a small frame of time. Francis Fanny Billing and Catherine Kate Frary are good friends, living near to each other. The death of the wife of Fanny's lover creates questions in the small village, as we often find in our historical crime stories, one death tends to lead retrospectively to other previous deaths. The series of deaths was referred to as the case of the Burnham Poisoners. We hope you enjoy the show. In the small hamlet of Burnham, overtones of sex and violence are hidden in the background. Francis Fanny Billing is having an illicit affair with neighbour Peter Taylor, who is married to Mary Taylor. Within Burnham, on North Street, are three cottages, side by side. At one end, Frances Fanny Billing and her husband James and their nine children. Peter Taylor and his wife are in the middle, next to the Billings. They have no children. And Catherine Kate Frary, her husband Robert and their three children are in rented rooms above the carpenter's shop, next to the Taylors. Background Fanny Billing and James Billing Fanny Billing was a washerwoman. She was a regular churchgoer and her husband James was an agricultural labourer. The family were poor but considered respectable. Peter Taylor and Mary Taylor Peter Taylor was a journeyman shoemaker by trade but had suffered ill health and had become a barber. Mary worked as a shoe binder and they had no children. Fanny and Peter began an illicit affair that was well known in the community. It is recorded that Fanny's husband, James, had beaten both Fanny and Peter Taylor at one time when he had found them conversing secretly together. Catherine, Kate, Frary and Robert Frary. Catherine Kate Frary, aged 46, was a childminder. Kate Frary did not enjoy a sterling reputation herself. There were rumours in the small village that she was having an illicit affair of her own with a Mr Gridley. Her husband, Robert Frary, was also an agricultural labourer like James Billing. Incident. On the 21st of February, Harriet Southgate, a child that was minded by Kate Frary, became suddenly dangerously ill and in great pain. At the same time, Robert Frary, Kate's husband, was also writhing in pain. He had been agonisingly unwell for approximately two weeks. Baby Harriet was given some warm water sweetened with sugar by Kate Frary. The child died in the early hours of that morning, and it was determined that she had died of natural causes. Robert Frary, although still alive, failed to improve. A friend of Kate's was asked to purchase some white arsenic to kill mice and rats. The arsenic was duly purchased, although news reports are unclear who exactly purchased the poison if The poison had been purchased together. Visit The mother of poor dead baby Harriet Southgate came to visit the Frary household to inquire after Robert Frary, who was still unwell. Fanny Billing was there and offered the mother a glass of porter. The mother noticed sediment within the cup and handed it back, stating, that she did not take sugar in her porter. 
Fanny Billing then handed the cup to Robert Frary, encouraging him to drink it as it would do him good. That evening, when being visited once more, Robert was seen retching violently. Two days later, Robert Frary was dead. It was noted that both Fanny Billing and his wife, Kate Frary, were attending Robert when he died. Gossip Gossip was rife within the small village regarding the recent spate of deaths. Kate was encouraged by neighbours to have her husband disinterred and his body tested. Kate refused. Mary Taylor Meanwhile, Mary Taylor is unhappy about the affair her husband is having with Fanny Billing and loudly and publicly argues with Fanny Billing about the illicit affair with her husband. Approximately one week after the painful death of Robert Frary, Fanny Billing is known to have bought some arsenic. She stated it was for a local woman named Webster. It was found later that Mrs. Webster knew nothing about a request for arsenic. Some two weeks later, Mary Taylor became convulsingly sick and dies painfully. On her deathbed, she is lovingly fed some gruel made by Fanny Billings' good friend, Kate Frary. From the Norwich Mercury, April the 4th, 1835. The town of Burnham Market in Norfolk and the vicinity for some miles round have for the last week been in the most dreadful state of excitement caused by the discovery of three diabolical murders which have already been committed and a plan laid for taking away the lives of several other people. The circumstances that led to the discovery was as follows. A woman named Mary Taylor, the wife of Peter Taylor, a journeyman shoemaker, was taken with a violent retching after dinner on Thursday the 12th instant, and although medical assistance was procured, she died at five o'clock that same afternoon. Mr. Kremer, the surgeon, as soon as he saw her, pr pronounced her to have been poisoned. An inquest was held on the body on the following Saturday, when the jury, after sitting till eleven at night, adjourned the inquest till Monday, and then, having no evidence as to how the deceased came by the arsenic, which had been found in the stomach, returned a verdict to the effect that she had died by taking arsenic, but that it was unknown by what means it was administered. There were certain rumours that Peter Taylor, the husband of the deceased, had been connected with a married woman named Fanny Billing, who lived next door, and this connection seems to have been a great cause of uneasiness between Taylor and his wife. Approximately a week or two before Mary Taylor, the deceased, had died, it seems she had taxed Fanny Billing with it, and they had had a quarrel. It was also discovered that Billing had a short time before bought three pennies worth of arsenic of a druggist. Some flour that was in Taylor's house was also found to contain a quantity of arsenic, and from this the deceased had made dumplings on the day she died. These facts coming out, the magistrates thought proper to hold a special meeting on the Wednesday for the further investigation of the matter, and Peter Taylor and Francis Billing were brought before them, examined and remanded for further examination. As Billing, however, was going away, a woman living next door named Mary, who was frequently in and out of Mrs Taylor's, was heard to say to her, Ma, hold your own and they can't hurt us. This led to further suspicion, and Catherine Frary was apprehended. It was then recollected that Catherine Frary's husband and a child they kept had died about a fortnight before, 
very suddenly. Orders were then given to have the two bodies disinterred. Their stomachs were sent to Norwich to be analysed and they also were found to contain arsenic. On Tuesday, Frances Fanny Billing was fully committed to take her trial for the murder of Mary Taylor at the forthcoming Assizes. She is nearly 40 years old and has had 14 children, nine of which are now alive. She has confessed to the whole, but she, Frances Billing, says that Catherine Frary gave the poison to Mrs Taylor. She has also confessed to other acts of the same kind with Catherine Frary and that there were several other persons they had marked out as their next victims. Frances Billing had made an attempt to poison her husband about the same time, but he did not take a sufficient quantity and recovered. Peter Taylor is still remanded, and Catherine Frary has been taken speechless since Tuesday and cannot be recovered. The wife of Catherine's brother, who lived at Burnham, overly died about the same time suddenly, but has not yet been taken up. Peter Taylor says he was taken sick on the Thursday with his wife, but that he threw up and got better. Mrs. Catherine Frary was sent for to attend on Mrs. Mary Taylor, and a witness by the name of Rowley says that when he was in at Taylor's to be shaved, he saw Frary in the house making Mary Taylor some gruel. Rowley continues that Catherine Frary had put something into the gruel from a paper on the point of a knife. It was white, almost like flour. It is believed that in all probability to make assurance doubly sure, Catherine Frary poisoned also Mary Taylor's gruel. It was, too, the merest wonder in the world that the poisoned flour, for, for it had not then been found to be poisoned, was not taken to provide for the funeral. Indeed, this seems to have been anticipated by the wretches, and then the whole family would have been their victim. But the management of the funeral were fortunately taken out of Frary's hands, and the flower providently unused. Peter Taylor was born a good character for many years until he got connected with this woman. His wife Mary Taylor was a very industrious person, and although they had no family, they lived very comfortably together. She was 47 years of age, and he is about the same. From the initial arrest of Francis Billing and Peter Taylor, Catherine Frary is also now rounded up. In essence, the two ladies have an agreement together to do each other's murder. Catherine Frary to kill Mary Taylor, the wife of Peter Taylor, who Francis was having an affair with, and then Francis to kill Catherine's husband for her. The baby Harriet Southend seems to have been the test case to ensure the poison worked. The attempt to kill Francis Billings's husband failed as he recovered. From the Clon Mel Herald of 19th of August, 1835. Cases of murder. Fanny Billing and Catherine Frary were indicted for the willful murder of Mary, the wife of Peter Taylor, by administering arsenic in gruel. Mr Pendergast and Mr Cooper prosecuted and Mr Palmer defended the prisoners. The prisoner Frary is the wife of a shoemaker at Burnham, and at the time of the commission of the murder in question, she lodged at the house of a Mrs. Lake next door to the deceased Mary Taylor. Peter Taylor, the husband of the murdered woman, is a hair cutter, and in the beginning of the present year formed an illicit connection with Mrs. Billing, the prisoner. This begat jealousy on the part of Mrs. Taylor, whom the prisoner 
Catherine Frary, in consequence, resolved upon murdering. For Mrs. Frary's services to Mrs. Billing in this murder, the latter, Mrs. Billing, agreed to assist the former, Catherine Frary, in getting rid of Mr. Frary's husband, who had become jealous of her, and these two atrocious schemes were forthwith carried into complete and fatal effect. In the latter end of February, the two prisoners went to the shop of a chemist at Burnham, where they purchased three pennies worth of white arsenic, stating that they were sent for it by a Mrs. Webster, a tradesman's wife, who, however, had not sent them. The arsenic was put into two separate papers, and the word poison written each in large, legible letters. One packet was procured to poison Mrs. Taylor, and the other packet for Catherine Frary's husband. In the evening of the 4th of March, Mrs. Talbot, a sister to Mrs. Taylor, called upon her, having heard that she was unwell. She found the poor woman sitting in a chair, vomiting frightfully, and in the greatest agony, calling out for water, and that her stomach was on fire. Peter Taylor, her husband, was sitting by her side. Mrs. Talbot, finding her sister so unwell, went to the house of the prisoner, Frary, for some gruel, and having found some standing on the hob, she warmed it and took it back to the sick woman. The prisoner Frary entered the room of the invalid at the same time, and after observing that the gruel was too thick, she took it from Mrs. Talbot and presently returned with it in a more liquid state, and said to Mrs. Taylor in the blandest tone, I hope, my dear, you will take some of it now from me, and that it will do you all the good I wish. At this moment the husband called Mrs. Talbot out of the room, leaving his wife alone with Mrs. Frary. Upon the return of Mrs. Talbot to the bedroom, she perceived that her sister had eaten some of the gruel, and found her much weaker than she had left her. She requested Frary go for the doctor, but Frary excused herself on the plea that it was no use, the woman was a dead woman. Frary did agree to go on the solicitation of the husband. Mary Taylor died before the doctor arrived and was laid out by the prisoners and two or three others, who regaled themselves with copious streams of tea after the ceremony, in the very room which lay the dead body of the person whom two of them had recently murdered. The unusual appearance of the dead body excited suspicion, and the coroner held an inquisition, where it appeared beyond all doubt that the two prisoners had poisoned the unoffending woman. The village blacksmith, who called early in the evening in question at Taylor's house for the purpose of being shaved, found the prisoner, Frary, raking together the embers of Taylor's fire. Having done this, Frary left the house, but presently returned, bringing with her some gruel in a small pannikin, which she heated on the embers. She then unfolded a small paper out of which she took nearly a teaspoon, what the blacksmith thought was salt or lump sugar, which she put into the gruel. The prisoner Billing then came in and inquired how Mrs. Taylor was. Frary replied, she's very ill. Frary presently said, I'm boiling her a little gruel, and I shall sit with her husband and keep him company in this lonesome an hour or two. She then put the gruel into a basin and took it upstairs to Mrs. Taylor, saying to Billing, I hope it will settle her poor thing. After remaining upstairs for some time, Frary returned with the basin, from which a considerable quantity of the gruel had been taken, and went with it into her own house, accompanied by Billing. It was the poisoned gruel 
which Mrs. Talbot unfortunately found upon going to the prisoner's house a few hours afterwards. But the deceased had previously taken a too fatal copious draught from the hands of Freire to be further injured by that which was subsequently administered. Mary Taylor was dead. Several surgeons examined the body of the deceased and applied the usual tests to ascertain the presence of arsenic. Results followed each and all these tests, and metallic arsenic was reproduced in rather considerable quantities, so that the gruel must have been highly impregnated with the deadly poison. Upon the termination of the inquest, Peter Taylor and the woman were taken into custody, and upon their journey to the jail, Francis Billing was heard to say to him, Hold your tongue, Peter, and then they can't do nothing with you. I feel sure. This wretched woman, Francis Billing, appeared throughout the transaction to be more solicitous for her paramour than for herself. The prisoners made general assertion of their innocence, but offered no substantial defence. Mr. Baron Holland at great length summed up the evidence, and the jury, after a short consultation, found the prisoners guilty. The two prisoners were then arraigned upon an indictment charging them with the willful murder by poison of Robert Frary, the husband of one of the prisoners, Catherine Frary. The deceased Robert Frary was the unfortunate man whose murder these abandoned women agreed upon the price of Mrs. Frary's assisting Francis Billing to murder Mrs. Taylor. The Poisoning of Robert Frary It did not appear that any ill will existed between Mrs. Billing and Robert Frary, or between Mrs. Frary and Mrs. Taylor. It appeared by the evidence that Robert Frary was sitting at tea with his wife and a friend. The prisoner Billing came in with a jug of porter and asked Mrs. Frary to give her a teacup. The prisoner Frary rose and took a cup from the shelf and gave it to Billing, who poured some of the porter into it after shaking it up in the mug. Having done so, she turned her back and, having stirred it up with the finger, handed it to the husband, who drank it up immediately. The friend who sat at tea observed a white substance in the mug, who said to Mr. Frary, why I could not drink sugar in my port if it was never so. No reply was made, and Billing left the house with the rest of the porter in the mug. In the course of the night, Frary, the husband, was taken ill, and after lingering in great agony for two days, death put an end to his suffering. His wife had him buried with all possible expedition. After the funeral, Mrs. Southgate, the person who was drinking tea with the deceased when the fatal dose was administered, said to Mrs. Frary, If I were you, I'd have my husband took up again and examined, for I'm sure the world will talk, and I'd shut the world's mouth. The prisoner replied, I should not like it, by no means would you, to which Mrs. Southgate answered, Yes, I would like it, for if you don't, it will be a check on you and your children after you. Neighbourhood Gossip The story of the porter with the sugar in it got nosed abroad soon after this, and the body was exhumed, and upon examination in the stomach, a quantity of arsenic was found in it. The purchase of arsenic by the prisoners was proved, as on the former trial and their own voluntary statements before the coroner were put into evidence. Mr. Baron Boland, having summed up the evidence with his accustomed care, the jury returned a verdict of guilty. The learned Baron immediately proceeded to put on his black cap, the fatal symbol of death, and to pass on the wretched women the last sentence of the law. They were ordered for execution at noon on Monday, and their bodies were directed to be buried 
within the prison walls. Catherine Frary, towards the close of the learned judge's affecting and solemn address, fell into hysterics, and both the prisoners seemed duly sensible of their fearful situation. But no sympathy appeared to be felt towards these monsters in human form on the part of the audience. Thus ended an inquiry into one of the most atrocious deeds of violence ever perpetrated in this country. This crime was notable in 1835. This was well before the infamous Palmer trial of 1856. Also, what became clear in the confession was the long list of forthcoming victims they had in mind. There seemed to be no financial reason for the murders or the planned victims. None of the victims were enrolled in a society. The murders were simply a way to get rid of people they no longer had any use for or whom they had taken a dislike to. Although arsenic was confirmed in all three bodies, Mary Taylor, Robert Frary, and baby Harriet Southgate, the prosecution, as was usual, charged the murderers with only a few of the possible crimes. This was in the unexpected event of the accused being found not guilty. It had also been brought up that Catherine Frary's brother had died unexpectedly before. As far as we can see, this line of inquiry was not pursued. From the Sheffield Iris, 18th of August, 1835. Murder and horrible depravity. Fanny Billing and Catherine Frary were convicted at the Norwich Assizes on Friday week of poisoning Mary, the wife of Peter Taylor, and also Robert Frary, the husband of Catherine Frary. Peter Taylor had formed an illicit connection with the prisoner, Fanny Billing, who plotted to remove his wife out of the way by poisoning her. Catherine Frary agreed to assist in this murder on condition that Francis Billing assisted Frary to poison her own husband, Robert Frary. Both of the crimes were accomplished. The prisoners were found guilty and executed on Monday. The public execution of two women simultaneously drew huge crowds of reportedly between twenty and 30,000 people. Calcraft was their executioner. The execution from the Kentish Gazette, 18th of August, 1835. On Monday, the sentence of the law was carried into execution upon the two women. Francis Billing ascended the scaffold with the greatest firmness, but Catherine Frary was obliged to be supported from the jail to the platform, and the two miserable wretches, one of forty and the other of forty-six years of age, were launched into eternity amidst an immense concourse of spectators between twenty or thirty thousand people, above one half of whom were women. Follow-up. Hannah Shorten, the friend who had helped the murderers by purchasing one of the doses of arsenic, is found in the records at age 80 in the 1851 census, living in Wells and described as a pauper. James Billing, the only spouse to survive, died in 1871, aged 84, in Alderbury in Wiltshire. Peter Taylor and what of Peter Taylor, the husband of Mary Taylor and lover of Fanny Billing? He was released during the trial of Catherine Frary and Fanny Billing. Peter Taylor was at the execution to watch his lover and her friend be hanged, but he was spotted by locals, hounded by the crowds and forced to flee. He escaped to his home village of Wissensnet, but he was on limited time. Both Catherine Frere and Francis Billing implicated him in their confessions by stating he had been aware of the poisoning attempt on his wife 
even if he had not been directly involved. The investigation was reopened and three weeks after Frary and Billings' execution, Peter Taylor was found, sent to prison and committed for trial as an accessory before the fact to his wife's murder. From the London Packet and New Lloyd's Evening Post, 4th of April 1836. In the criminal court, a man named Peter Taylor was tried as an accessory before the fact in the Burnham cases of poisoning, of which two women were convicted and executed last summer assizes. Having given a very detailed account of the evidence upon the former trials, it is unnecessary to repeat the facts. The prisoner was sentenced and left for execution. Peter Taylor was executed on the 23rd of April, 1836, at Norwich Castle. That concludes this episode of Serial Killer Saturdays, Francis Billing and Catherine Frary, the Burnham Poisoners. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We're aiming for 1,000 subscribers. If you have already subscribed, our sincere thanks for your support. We very much appreciate it. We upload content daily with longer episodes four times a week. Tuesdays, an an in-depth look at a case known in its day. Wednesdays, recounting the build-up to the Ripper murders in Whitechapel Wednesdays. Thursdays, a collection of stories based on a theme. And our Serial Killer Saturdays, where we focus on a historical serial killer, their background and their crimes. And a new series we are trialling, Eccentric Sundays, where we share stories of the UK's rich history of eccentrics of all descriptions. We upload shorter, but we believe still interesting stories on the other days of the week. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for listening and watching. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.